One, two, test. Okay, there we are. So we're starting or continuing in this series, Life-Changing Apps, and we've been digging through the book of James, and I don't know about you, but I've been really loving this series because sometimes as preachers we get up here and we can talk about stuff that's theological, and it's all up here, and then our actual living it out is kind of in the middle somewhere. And James is one who gets right in our face and says, listen, as followers of Jesus Christ, this is the behavior you should be producing. And today, as we dig into this, we think about how people want to be loved. I mean, I want to be loved. I want to be loved by, in fact, it's, it's one of my shadow weaknesses is I want to be loved too much. I mean, I think everybody should like me, right? <laughs> Why are you laughing at that? <laughs> What's not to like? No, I mean, that's a downfall of my personality, actually, and I, I have to monitor that and correct that, because we all want to be loved, and, and the, the idea that everyone should love us, and I, I really wrestled with that for a while for myself until I really realized Jesus was the perfect person. People hated him. They actually killed him. And as far as I know, no one's out for my physical demise, you know, so I can be okay there. But as we, as we look at this, people want to be loved, but we find that we're not always, always loved. And we want to be part of the in crowd. We want to feel a sense of belonging, but we don't always feel that or experience that. And I, and I wonder, why does that happen? And I think one of the reasons we feel rejection is people tend to stereotype people. Are we up and running? Okay. Testing, one, two, there we go. Battery makes all the difference, right? So we tend to stereotype people. The story is told of a judge who was interviewing a prospective juror, and uh, the, the judge says to that prospective juror, so why is it that you don't want to serve on the jury? And the ju prospective juror says, well, judge, I'm a biased person, and as I look over at the man standing over there, I can definitely see he's guilty. To which the judge says, well, the man you're pointing at is not the defendant, that's his attorney. <laughs> you know, right? We can, we can be so biased on people. So open your Bibles to James, James chapter 2. And we're going to take a look at how are we cultivating rhythms of spiritual transformation and wholeness in our, our own lives. And today we're talking about attitudes, attitudes and relationships and the actions that we do. And, and as we think about labeling people, James is going to say, now let's talk about it in the church. Because we do it out there, but it happens in here too. It happens in these walls of this facility that we tend to label people and we, we mischaracterize them before we even get to know them. And that's where this, this uh, scripture for me is, is, is difficult. It's, it, it, because it's so raw and so real in my life right now. In fact, our trust app today, we're saying this. God wants his people to demonstrate pure religion by overcoming the practice of partiality and by producing deeds of compassion. That's, that's our go-to here today. This is what God desires, and we're going to look at James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. And I invite you to open your Bibles. If you don't have one with you, get your phone out. It's okay. Get your phone app out. Um, U version of the Bible is a great one. And uh, get to James chapter 2, or use that Bible there for you in front of you. It's page 1196. Before I read this text, I've already mentioned this was a difficult passage for me this week. Um, some of you are aware I was in Southern California at our Far West Regional Meeting, and this is a gathering of church leaders from California and Oregon and Washington and Idaho and Arizona and, um, and where else, Montana. And so there's like seven different classes represented in the Far West region, and I'm not sure exactly how many churches that is, but I think it's close to 200. It's a lot of churches represented and one of the challenges we have in our far west region is um, not seeing eye to eye on some particular issues. In, in fact, one of our candidates actually asked this question of our search, search team. Is there anything in the RCA that New Life Community Church does not agree with? Interesting question to ask, right? 
And so as he asked that question, I quickly started reeling and thinking, I wonder what it is, because if you go to rca.org, uh, positions, backslash positions, you'll see some of the positional papers that have been written um, from Synod, which is our governing body, saying this is where we stand on these issues like abortion, um, you know, right to life issues and stuff like that. The one you'd be interested in is the, uh, about the right to bear arms, <laughs> because back in the 70s, uh, a paper was written that we should turn in our guns. <laughs> and so I assume that's probably not the one that uh, he was questioning. But instead, there's a, a, a lot happening out in our community today on the whole issue of same-sex marriage. And you see it, you know, churches and denominations are wrestling with this, this topic and this issue. And indeed, that's the question that he had for us. Because as I was in the far west region, we do have one church in San Francisco that is uh, open, welcoming, and affirming to those of same-sex uh, traditions, the LBTGQ community. And so we're wrestling with that as a governing body is how do we hold up the law or our understanding of the traditional biblical view of marriage between a man and a woman versus love, where Jesus would say, you know, we need to also demonstrate and care and love people. Because historically, I would say as a church, as a Christian church, we probably stood really strong on, on the law. We know our theology, we know our position, we know where we stand. But it's unfortunate, in my opinion, that we have lacked in love. And how do we love folks that are in that tendency or in that understanding into the kingdom? And so we're wrestling with that as, as a group of people. But you need to know if you're here at New Life that we have made a clear stand on the biblical interpretation of marriage between a man and a woman. As a region, we have made that commitment as well, Far West region. So it's interesting that this candidate would ask about that question. And so in some ways, we haven't made it a major issue as our leadership here in the church. But at the same time, I think you should be aware that those conversations are happening out there and we're wrestling with our polity of how do we deal with a rogue congregation in our denomination that is choosing different than what everyone else is. And so as I say that, on a very personal level, you think about this in your relationships around you, and I had to recently say goodbye to a friend, someone I love dearly, someone I've spent a lot of time with, but we didn't see eye to eye, and there was hurt, and there was things going on that you get to a point where you say, I love you in Christ, goodbye. Right? So, so, so in some way, I feel like I shouldn't be standing here today. Somebody else should be bringing this message because I want to do it with integrity. It's real important to me. So I'm going to do my best to not let my own personal hurt, injury, Garbage stuff flood this time, okay? So let's open the Word of God, and let's read it. James chapter 2, would you stand with me as we read God's Word together? My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? He promised those who love him. But you have insulted the poor. It's not the rich who are exploiting you, but they are not the ones who are dragging you into court. Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you've become a lawbreaker. 
Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who's not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is God's word. Go ahead and have a seat. Improper discrimination is the the first thing we see here. James opens up this chapter by saying, don't show favoritism. Don't show favoritism. And, and he's talking to us here in the church. And we could say favoritism, as Jane points out, is sinful. It's a sin. But it's so subtle. Because we're all guilty of it. I mean, it's very common to look for people who look like you. When you go to any group event or whatever, who am I going to connect with? Very rarely do we go to those who look opposite of us. We tend to want to feel this sense of love and connection and most likely people who think like I do. And so this whole idea here, we we see this glorious Christ. And I love how James says that. Our, you know, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. So he's, he's setting the foundation. He's saying because you're a believer and glorious, he uses that term glorious, meaning all-encompassing of God Almighty Himself. This is who Jesus is. This is who we believe in. This is who we trust in. Is God Almighty our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. The full representation of God's presence and His majesty. That's who James is talking That's our common ground. No matter what you look like or how you act, what, that if you're a believer in Christ, that is our common ground right there. And notice James says, my brothers, and I use the, uh, today's NIV where it adds sisters. So it's all inclusive. It's just not the men. It's us as believers, brothers and sisters. He says, recognize your pro- profession. And who Christ is. And then he goes on to about distinctive seating where he, he tells this story, right, of a church meeting or a gathering of believers. And um, their practice of favoritism shows up because it's a packed house. There's only probably one seat left remain. And uh, whoever it is is in the back and says, hey, hi there. And they both come in at the same time. One is uh, very rich, according to the, uh, the story, shown, demonstrated by the clothes they're wearing, the fancy ring. That was oftentimes a sign of great prestige. And then you have what's said a poor or shabby clothes. Some commentators will say it was a working man. So it wasn't necessarily, you know, it was like you came in from the fields kind of a guy. Okay, so it didn't mean like a homeless person. It was more like a working man with his hands out in the fields. And we have this comparison. And we see this, hey, the rich guy, right here is your seat. And the other guy, hey, so you can sit right on the floor. Uh, fortunately, our greeters don't do that here at New Life. They've been trained differently. And so they, they understand that we don't have distinctive seating here for us. But what I love about James is he's saying this is happening in your fellowship and you need to stop it. Okay? You need to knock it off because it's not reflective of who God is. It's not reflective of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. One commentator said this, the gospel does require a change in social relations within the church. The church's role in the world is redemptive, not judicial. The church's role in the world is redemptive, not judicial. See, that's the pressing question for us it's, as, as we think about ourselves here as a community believers is, are, are we really united around the principles of Christ? Because if we are, it, it, all these other pieces shouldn't matter. What you look like, what your economic status is, what toys you have, what you're lacking in life. It shouldn't matter if we're we're united around the principles of Christ. We're pursuing Christ and Christ's priorities in the world today. And that's what binds us together. We see the discrimination of God. I knew I shouldn't have used that word. Discrimination of God. You know, James in verse 1 says, my brothers and sisters. But here he amplifies it when he says, listen. 
You ever have someone tell you that? They'll say, hey, listen. Your ears perk up, right? It's, it's meant to do that. And James does that right here with this, this listen, because James is real concerned about how believers are dealing with the poor among them. And he's connecting their faith with their actions and behavior. And so he's saying, listen, listen to what God is telling us. And he talks about how special the poor are in God's economy. We see it throughout the Old Testament. There, there were laws written in, in the Old Testament that we're supposed to minister to the poor. We're supposed to be attentive to the orphan, to the alien, to the stranger, right? Those, those resound. And the church of God at that time in the Old Testament, Israel, was commended for doing that, but then also challenged by prophet after prophet for not doing it. Indeed, that is a characteristic of us here at, at New Life. I can remember in our community, people would say, oh, that's the Rich Dairy Church. They would say that. But they don't say that anymore. What I hear instead is, that's church anybody's welcome. That's what we want to be known for, right? Because we're all seeking the same thing, and that is restoration through the blood of Jesus Christ. And the only way that... He can do that and give that to us. And so here we see a God who says, you know, poor believers are special in my heart because their faith is so high. You see, when you have everything, you don't worry about a lot of stuff, right? You don't worry about where your next meal is going to come from. You don't worry what you're going to do if your car breaks down. You don't worry about But pe sometimes people who are economically challenged do. They're not always sure. That's why I'm thankful that we're, we're partnership with Helping Hands here in Wendell to help the working poor. God mandates that we get involved and we be a part of that and we can do it together here at New Life Church through other churches and organizations here in our town to be a, not just a helping hand, but a helping hand up in God's economy because God works His gracious, saving work you know, God's kingdom. It's powerful and the opportunity we have to be a part of it. And again, going back to the trust app, God wants his people to demonstrate pure religion by overcoming the practice of partiality and by producing deeds of compassion. You know, here at New Life, it was back in 2014 that we put together some relational guidelines. Our vitality team did that. We said, you know, there's some things that we need to be aware of as believers that we have in commonality. And I, I can still remember at that time, a number of people were saying, I, I don't need a, a relational covenant because I have my Bible. And it's absolutely true. We, we have God's word in front of us. God's word tells us again and again how we're to act together. And sometimes it tells us, just stop it. Stuff. Look at this chapter in Colossians where Paul is writing to the church. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. Clothe yourselves. That means putting something on. That means you have to put a little effort into it. right? You actually intentionally do this. Have compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Did you wrestle with any of that this week like I did? Because it was tough. My flesh was wanting to speak in ways that were not kind. Right? I'm sure you, maybe, maybe you didn't wrestle with that, but I sure did. And it says this, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, just let, just let that sit. If you come into this church and you see someone and you... You have a grievance with them and you walk the other way, something's wrong and it needs to be fixed. And only by the gospel and the pleading of the cross can we do that. And I love that Paul says, as much as possible, be at peace with everyone as it depends upon you, right? So we, it's always a two way thing, right? We have our part and they have their part. But that whole thing, forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. You know, in our community, these, these spaces are tried 
They're trying to create places for people to gather like that. It may be soccer. It may be football. It may be at the bar. It may be, but they're trying to create these spaces where these things happen. But God says, it's my church. That's where this happens because they don't have, outside of Christ, they don't have the foundation of what we need to forgive as God has forgiven us through Christ, right? They don't have that at the local PTA meeting. But we have it here in the church. And if any community should exemplify these characteristics, it's us, right? And we actually welcome and love everyone as a creation of God, created in the image of God. Now, some of them have really messed that image up, I got to admit, right? But at the same time, they are created in the image of God, and we are to love them as Christ loves us, especially in the church. We think about to be civil, compassionate, and Christ-honoring. There we go. I missed that one for you. How do we see eye to eye by being civil, compassionate, and Christ-honoring? Let's get to some encouragement, right? Because the next section, James does that for us. Mercy. Mercy that fulfills the royal law. He says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as law breakers. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said that, right? Here, it's interesting. James is actually pointing back to Leviticus. So he's pointing back to the Old Testament when he says this. Leviticus 19, 18 says this, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And so here James is saying, this is the way of excellence. This is is an excellent deed that that James is talking about loving your neighbor as yourself. That that God calls us to that, to love my neighbor as myself. That's the antidote for favoritism. Jesus would say that because no one's outside that boundary of God's love. And um, then we get into verses 9 through 11 where there's an offense at every point. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. And watch this, verse 10. Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. You know, it's in our community and where sometimes people think, you know, God's going to love me because I'm a pretty good guy. I'm not as bad as that guy. You know, point to the other person. Look at the, the terrible things they've done. At least I haven't done those things. That's why James says, if you commit adultery or kill someone, it's, it's the same. And there's a real practical way of looking at it. Maybe, maybe you've seen I put some cookies up here. I have a platter, platter of cookies at, up here. And if I was to offer you one, some of you would be like, no, I'm not eating any sugar, so no, thank you, right? You, or are they gluten-free? You know, so Tom's raising his hand. I'll take one of those cookies right now. Some of you are like, yeah, pass them around. But how about if I told you there's a special ingredient in these cookies? It's one of my, it's, it's, it's a great ingredient. I put a teaspoon of dog poop in the batter. So, Chuck, <laughs> I'll pass, right? You know, that's what James is saying. We, we tend to think sin as greater than or less than. Like, well, I only lie. I don't, I don't kill anybody. James is reminding us, and God views it that way. No, no, no. One sin, you're guilty of it all. It so pollutes you like dog poop in a cookie dough. Right? It's, it, it, it's a disease that follows us around. It's in our DNA. And it came on board in Genesis in the original Adam, the first Adam. That's where it showed up. And it's in us again and again. We see it. But here's the great news. The best news is the second Adam came. The second Adam came. And that's Jesus Christ. And he demonstrated. uh, He was able to conquer sin. And through death and resurrection, he imparts that now to us. 
so that we are no longer the story of our past. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus as holy people dedicated for his service. And we can rise above that because while the Adam sin power is in us, greater is he that lives in me than he that is in the world, right? That Jesus Christ, his Holy Spirit, was so much greater than the original Adam sin and the consequence that we now stand in victory. And that's the mercy of the royal law. And when I look at you, that I can love you because you're a brother and a sister in Christ like I love myself. Praise God for that. The freedom giving. James talks about to speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. See, James says the, the law gives us freedom. You know, and I think in some of our social issues and some of these hot topics or, or what's going on around us and we balance the law and love and we come back and forth and we have this high value of love and our, our law and our theology is right, but our love seems to be lacking sometimes. How do we hold them in balance? And I think God demonstrates that very clearly for us in the Ten Commandments. He tells us straight up, He said, because you are my people, this is how you're supposed to live. And as a Reformed church, we believe God is sovereign. He's in control of everything. God is in control of all creation, borders of kingdoms, everything. God is sovereign. He's in control. And God is also sovereign in morality. Our God is a God of moral standards, right? And so we see that in the Ten Commandments. As my people, this is how you are to live. Because as you love me and you love your neighbor as, my, as yourself, if their donkey gets out, give it back to them. Right? If your neighbor's wife is attractive, don't sleep with her. Be out of love for me and love for your neighbor. This is how it's acted out. Don't steal from them. Don't bear false witness against them. If you love me and you're my people, you're to live out your faith in action by loving your neighbor as yourself. That means be honest and with integrity and love. Right? Because see, somehow we get this idea that if we hold up the law, we're not very loving. But God says, yes, you are. You can be loving and hold up the law. And others will say, well, we put the, if, if, if we're so loving, we, get the, we don't pay attention to the law. And God would say, no, you, you need both. Jesus demonstrated it again and again and again. He was so great at pushing through social boundaries that people put up in their lives as well as in their communities. Christian community. Life together in Christ. I hope you'll grab a hold of that today. Because the law doesn't bind us or condemn us. It sets us free. It sets us free to love, truly love, like Jesus loved. As members of the church of Christ, we're inclusive. We're inclusive to people that don't look like us. wrestling with a moment because I can't stand here and not do it with oh, doing it with integrity it's one of these sermons where it's preacher preach to yourself okay the trust app God wants his people to demonstrate pure religion by overcoming the practice of partiality and per by producing deeds of compassion. Would you say that with me? Let's repeat it together. God wants his people to demonstrate pure religion by overcoming the practice of partiality and by producing deeds of compassion. True religion helps the poor. Favoritism insults them. The poor are forever told to sit on the floor Stand in a corner. But if there's one community in this world where we should get it right with equal treatment, it's the church. Because as the saying goes, the ground's level. I keep looking for that. The ground's level at the foot of the cross, right? 
We're called to live life together in Christ-centered community. We're called to open our homes, our resources, and our very lives in the bond of fellowship with our brothers and sisters. Listen, if you're here as a guest today, and it's been a while since you've been in a church community, as pastor of New Life, I'd like to welcome you home. We don't get it right all the time. This is a God-blessed church, and I'm thankful for each and every one of you. I love you, and I love what you stand for. What are our next steps individually? If you have your outline out, you're going to see i got five of them. (laughs) It's a big, big piece. But this actually comes from North Point Church. It talks about gaps in life. It, a, lot of, a lot of our frustration and difficulty and challenge comes from, listen to this, unmet expectations. Unmet expectations. For instance, I expect you to be honest with me, but if I find out you said one thing to me and something else to someone else, that's called a lie. Now all of a sudden, you didn't meet my expectations. That makes me mad, right? <laughs> You've experienced that. And so, One of the things they say at North Point is when there's a gap between expectation and experience, I'll believe the best. See, usually when we hear something like that, it's third party. And I love Judge Judy, who says, it's inadmissible. I won't hear that. It's hearsay. And we're instructed very clearly in the Bible when someone says something about someone else, we're to go to that person. And so here at New Life, when you hear that, somebody's gossiping about somebody else, there's an offense or something, you have a duty. You have a duty to say, you know what? I don't really want to hear that about that person. Have you talked to them about it? Because that's what the scripture says. Go and talk to the person and reconcile, right? Through the gospel. Maybe you might even say, if you haven't gone talk to them, let's go talk to them together. Instead of believing the worst. And so, really? They did that? I can't believe it. Don't you see it on the news all the time? Somebody does something really criminal, and the neighbors are all like, he was a really great guy, I don't don't understand it, right? You know, it's like, what happened? So we want to think the best first. And when other, number two, when other people assume the worst, I'll come to your defense. See how that's laid out? What if I experience over time erodes my trust? I'll come directly to you and talk about it. And number four, when I'm not able to deliver on a promise, like when my actions create the gap, I'll inform you ahead of time. In other words, hey, I'm not going to be able to do that. I said I would, I would. When you confront me, this is the tough one, right? When you confront me about the gaps I've created, I will tell you the truth. We're to be honest, direct, and respectful. That was the training I received at the Far West region. How to be honest, direct, and respectful. Let's close in prayer. God, if we could just apply these in every relationship, trust would grow and our relationships would get stronger. I thank you for the victories you have given us where anyone walks through these doors here at New Life Church can feel welcome. Help us squelch where we have a tendency to show favorites. And God, we know that that might require you to do some humbling to us. We want to acknowledge, as James says, that is sin. Lord, we know that we're sinners. And we can't stop. So easily, I misjudge people, mislabel them, and I'm stained by my own hurts and habits and hang-ups. I have a tendency to ignore the needy. Sometimes my tongue is out of control, but my only hope is your mercy. When we love and receive all kinds of people, God, we know it's a demonstration that, God, your ways are becoming our ways. 
Because as James says, God, you love the poor, and we see that throughout your word. And we emulate your character and obey your will when we refuse to play favorites. In Jesus' precious name, amen.